The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor Thomas Goss, continuing our study of Lili Boulanger's masterpiece, Psalm 130 De Profundis. Before we jump into the orchestration analysis, let's take a look at why Lili was such an effective choral composer. For the answer to that question, we have to look at the guidelines of the Prix de Rome competition itself. The Academy of Arts and Letters routinely set a challenge of scoring a vocal work for each new competition. In a typical year, the first round of contestants would submit a fugue on a given subject and a shorter choral work. After this elimination round, four to five shortlisted contestants would then be confined to a secluded location and given a month to compose an orchestral oratorio or cantata on an exclusively prepared libretto or poem. What's interesting here is that from the very beginning of Lili's enrollment at the Paris Conservatoire at age 16, she began preparing herself methodically and artistically for this challenge. In the forefront was the knowledge that her health might betray her at any given time. So she experimented with composing vocal works as trial runs for the ultimate task. These are mainly choral works, and those which she didn't destroy are strikingly poetic and moving. But more than the product of composition was the act itself, training her mind and adjusting to the cycles of her chronic illness by undertaking one concerted effort after another. It's an approach that might not occur to composers of better health. What was the outcome of these efforts? The focus of her quickly evolving genius was placed firmly on vocal composition. Before she even entered the Prix de Rome in 1913, she had already produced artistically significant, even eternal repertoire in that genre. Her 1912 choral work, Pour le funeraire d'un soldat, won the Conservatoire's top student prize and is on a par with her best compositions. It's also superbly orchestrated. I can't make every orchestration lesson about Lili Boulanger, though it's tempting. After one or two more videos on the Psalm 130, we'll be moving on to Mahler, Ravel, and other great orchestral composers. But when we come back to Lili, I'd love to make this score the subject of a few more lessons. Back to the Prix de Rome and its effect on Lili. Her practice at marathon composing efforts paid off, and she won not only the grand prize, but the hearts of the concert-going public. This very shy and private person was suddenly a celebrity. It must have been a relief to eventually retire to Rome to begin her allotted sojourn. But she was not off the hook by any means. While staying at the Villa Medici, she was expected to compose further significant large-scale works and send them back to the Academy for approval. If we look at the scope of all such efforts composed by pre de rome winners over a century and a half, only the tiniest proportion of them are truly lasting works of genius. Debussy's contributions rise above this mostly forgettable collection, especially the Blessed Damozel. But Lili's rise the highest, because this duty was placed right at the peak of her brief but strikingly powerful creative life. Instead of supplying a handful of obligatory, quickly forgotten works, she composed a string of brilliant gems. The Psalms 24 and 129, the ancient Buddhist prayer, and this work, the Psalm 130 De Profundis. All these large-scale works were conceived during her stay in Rome, and completed within the year and a half before her death in 1918. Now on to the orchestration lesson. Stick around until the end of the video, as I'll have some more recommendations for Boulanger resources and recordings that you might want to check out. Before we get started, make sure you've viewed the last orchestration lesson, which explored the opening of the Psalm 130. I'll be referring to some of the musical architecture from that video, and I won't be taking the time to explain it all over again here. At the point where we left off last time, Lily had taken us all the way up to the entrance of the voices. Now let's look at the first section of choral exposition. It's worth mentioning here that Lily takes some liberties with the Louis Sagan version of the Bible in French. For instance, in the second line of the psalm, she changes the words voice and supplications to the more singable and urgent prière, or prayer. Furthermore, she introduces the words lave, adonai, this is the equivalent of saying Jehovah, Lord. Once again, 
Not only is the change entirely appropriate, but it supplies syllables that are very simple to set to music. Let's pick up things on the fourth bar, page 10 of the Durand edition. Coming at the end of a really brilliant contrapuntal episode, which we'll study at the February Masterclass on Patreon, Lily finishes things off with one last restatement of the opening theme. This time it's muted trombones and chorale, doubled by organ and two bassoons, with first horn taking the top note. It's a superbly dark, ominous combination. Lily wants to take the listeners all the way to the spiritual depths, before the coming invocation. The pedal E-flat simply oozes blackness, serusophone on the bottom, with organ at the first octave and roll timpani at the second octave above. Now the voices start, with the simplest kind of chanting. Lily is evoking the atmosphere of an ancient ritual, with very minimal melodic motion. The chorus starts with male and female voices doubling octaves. Note the use of the vocal tenor clef, aka the octave treble clef. And yet the repetition is rescued from monotony by the support of the rising motive from the opening. This is played by cellos, doubled first by bassoons and then by clarinets and cor anglais. Note how the voices suddenly rise over the sacred name La Ve, up to a higher D. The chord here is also worth analyzing, one of Lili's many examples of powerful, carefully orchestrated harmony. Functionally, it's a D minor 6-4 chord. In terms of voicing, it's a widely placed open D5 over a low F octave in bassoons and organ pedal. The coloration here is radiant and expectant, bristling with hope for release. Trilled flutes and clarinets bracket the oboes and cor anglais, glowing with the overtones of the horns below. Cellos fill in the picture by pushing hard at the same high D as the sopranos and altos. The whole gesture is rounded off by falling alternating chords of F-sharp minor and D minor in the upper strings. And all the imagination and cunning I've just described over the past two minutes is simply six bars of music. The last six bars invoked Jehovah, or Lave, and now the chorus begs for him to hear their prayer. I love the ruddiness of the sopranos and basses singing octaves, with altos and tenors chanting more quickly in the middle. Cor anglais, bassoons, and bass clarinet double the organ part. With all this action, it's easy to overlook the fact that the horns are playing the little four-note upside-down motive from the beginning. That motive will soon become one of the most important elements of musical architecture in the piece. The ritual has begun, and now we hear the lamentations. Each section of choir sings a form of descending half-steps, from single notes to beautifully voiced intervals and chords. Long-time followers of these orchestration lessons will remember her direction to sing with closed mouths, more than humming, as she wants the mouth to form the syllable ah behind the lips. As you read through this passage, look how Lily supports these cries with winds and horns. But it's not just the use of those instruments, but their registers. Lower oboes supporting higher tenors. High bass clarinet with bass voices. Low flutes combined with cor anglais doubling altos, and so on. Each combination has its own unique color. All of this is performed in front of a trilling triple octave in upper strings, with lower strings playing soft but heavy descending figures.
If you've been paying attention to the evolving modality of the last few pages, you'll probably notice that we're heading into Locrian territory. It's a great mode if you need the first step above the tonic to be a minor second, and you don't want to feel the dominance of the fifth. At the start of the next page, Lily fully commits to F Locrian, with a C-flat accidental added to the five-flat key signature. The fundamental anchor F is repeated by the horns as a written C for two pages, and then taken up by the bass instruments as a pedal point at the end of the passage. Against these horns, blaring trumpet and bass trombone rise bar by bar while the winds rip an octave run like Valkyries. The intriguing bass line is scored with a fierce doubling of bassoons, tuba, double basses, and cellos not in octaves, but in direct unison. Only the cerusophone plays the octave below, plus the barely audible harp. This makes the line more lean and mean, and less ponderous than the standard octave cellos and double basses. The voices enter by the third bar, back to their somber octaves, but now more insistent as they beg to be heard. The high point of the passage has this great chord played by the brass, an F7 flat 5. The trills from the first and second horn are a great touch. Not only do they bring a huge amount of life and color to the harmony, they also set up the quadruple octaves in upper strings for the closing of the passage. The winding down that follows is just as tense and full of interest as what came before. As the lower strings and trombones descend, and the winds cry out twice more, we wait expectantly for the master stroke. And what is that master stroke? Lily says more with less, cutting out everything but the chorus and organ, plus a bit of rhythmic pacing by timpani and pizzicato double basses. Now we finally see the meaning of the previous thematic lines as they pull together into this one statement. The opening slow theme by solo cello and tuba becomes the top line of the sopranos. The little inverted sob introduced by oboe appears again in the tenors, perfectly positioned amongst the surrounding voices. The harmony is no less striking than any of Lili's refrains in other works, like Vieille Prière Boudique. B-flat minor 6 alternating with the additive second chord, a B-flat minor 6 interval above an A minor 6 3 chord. It's chilling, heartfelt, mystical, and very human, all in one. From here, you can continue studying on your own. Read onward in the score yourself, and watch for some of the following features of scoring. How the strings slowly rise into the repeat of the refrain from the bottom of page 18, leading to a beautifully conceived contrapuntal passage. Then the lovely restatement on page 21, accompanied by harps, organ, and winds. I love the simplicity and directness of the scoring on page 22, where the male voices sing a chorale doubled by cellos, violas, and second violins. 
The harmonic changes reveal an approach to tonality that's entirely individual, where harmony and psychology merge effortlessly. Read all the way to the bottom of page 24, which is where next month's orchestration lesson will begin. My favorite moment in these last couple dozen bars is the superbly delicate little prayer at the top of page 24, with female voices and then tenors accompanied by first desk strings and high flute. It's a moment of magic that might have been the basis of an entire section or movement of another composer's work. Here, Lily just puts it right in the perfect place and then moves on, leaving you wanting more like so many other stellar moments in this work. That takes us all the way to rehearsal figure 9, where we'll pick it up next time. Before I go, let me leave you with a few more Lily Boulanger resources. After I posted last month's video, a viewer kindly pointed me in the direction of John Elliott Gardner's excellent recording with London Symphony Orchestra and the Monteverdi Choir. This includes all of Lili's psalm settings, plus the Vie à Prière Boudique and Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms. The sound quality is first rate, though I'm still not hearing the appropriate delicacy of balance in certain passages. I'm also quite fond of the Mark Stringer conducted recording on the timpani label with the Luxembourg Philharmonic. His approach is a bit more careful and ardently colorful than Gardner's, though the recording is nowhere near as well produced. Another advantage of the Stringer disc is that it includes Lili's other masterworks, Pour les funérailles d'un soldat, and the sister pieces D'un soir triste and D'un matin du printemps. For more historical background, IMSLP has an excellent thumbnail biography and analysis of Lili's Psalms by Helen Julia Miners, written in German and English. Nowhere near as technical as these videos, but worth a read. If you really want to delve deeply into Lily's biography and work, though, my Radio New Zealand program is still available for listening. I've linked everything below in the information, so have a look and a listen and let me know what you think. See you next month. Oh,